Pacers Bullying Prevention Center. I'd like to thank Anti-Bullying Institute, Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation for the opportunity to talk to you about creating a world without bullying. Pacers was founded in 1977, uh, and it was founded to help parents advocate for their children with disabilities. And through doing that work, through the four years that we've been around, we were hearing a lot of stories about bullying, because children with disabilities are bullied at a rate of two to three times that of their peers without disabilities. So we really were quite moved and wanted something intentional, not just for children with disabilities, but for all children. In 2006, we formed the National Bullying Prevention Center with the idea that no child should have to go through bullying or that considered a childhood rite of passage. So we have, the public primarily knows us through three websites, page.org slash bullying, which is our main website. We say that it's for adults, but there's no inappropriate content for middle and high school or kids doing reports. There's a lot of information up there. And actually, we have about 1,200 web pages through those three sites. Lot, and we archive it all on the main site. So if you're looking for something, use the search box on the main site and to find it on any of the three sites. Um, the middle box, the middle website there, is PacerTeensAgainstBullying.org, and that's suitable for middle and high school. And the one on the right is PacerKidsAgainstBullying.org, and that's for elementary, K-5, K-6, depending on, on who you're teaching or who you have as a child in your life. Uh, one of the things about these sites is that all of the resources up there, all of the content is free and downloadable. We want you to get the best information, and it's up on these sites, and it's for you to use. We have a lot of resources for teachers and educators of all kinds, for anyone involved in the life of a child, and so we want you to be able to access this information 24-7, and that's why it's up on the web for you. I'm going to talk about bullying dynamics. I want to do a little bit of education with you because it's important that we are all speaking from the same page with the same ideas and concepts and language. That helps everyone understand bullying uh, correctly and be able to apply good research-based solutions and strategies to it. We're going to talk about pro-social behaviors, some um, things that uh, research is uncovering about uh, what works long-term for bullying prevention and things that children need to be seeing on a daily basis. Positive and creative strategies that we, uh, we promote on our website that you can promote in your school community and then talk about your school community. Is that culture there and what would work best because you that the very so this education piece, as I said, is very important. And so the adults in your children's or your students' lives definitely still hang on to these common views and myths. That is a natural part of childhood. It's not. A child is born bullying that learned behavior. And as such, it can be unlearned. And we want people to know that because very often children who are bullying get tagged with the label of bullying, and that sticks. So we want to really think about what's natural. We also want to think about considering any kind of aggression, like bullying, as a natural part of anyone's experience. Hurt you? Obviously, we all know that that's not true. Words wound just as badly as fists do. And so we want to make sure that words are not in some separate category of being lesser when it comes to bullying. Words can really cut and hurt desperately. Some people deserve to be bullied. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Uh, bull will make kids tougher. I've actually heard this recently a few times uh, that somehow bullying could lead to children being taught this idea that they'd be more resilient because they'd be bullied. It's not true. Bullying breaks kids down. It, it doesn't follow that if we teach kids to be kinder, that they'll just be so soft that they won't be able to function in, in reality. That's not true either. I've heard that. Bullying does nothing but break children down. And we really need to get that idea that it's somehow helpful. 
helpful or omitted in a child's experience. We need to get that idea out. Um, in the teasing, that excuse and a justification for bullying that I hear a lot from kids and students, uh, even parents will say sometimes, uh, you know, really, they have too thin of a skin, they're too sensitive. And so somehow there's this idea that the target of bullying should have been a little, you know, less sensitive and then it wouldn't have bothered them. But that's how it works. So I go back to the two that I skipped. Um, some people deserve to be bullied. This is one that I check myself on often because out in pop culture, uh, TV, uh, web series, movies, things that revolve around comedy, there is a group or a person, a type of person that is singled out for being made fun of. And it's okay, you know, if it's not you. <laughs> so we need to look at that one in society. I'll just pick... Um, nerds, for example, uh, even though that seems like, you know, fairly benign, constantly going after a group and making it okay really takes away um, kindness and the acceptance of that difference. So we need to think about that as adults. And the last one that I talk to kids about often, telling a teacher about bullying, is tattling. It's one that we have to get very clear about and teach clearly to the children and students who are around us. We make the distinction at National Bullying Prevention Center, telling is what you do to get help. Tattling is what you do to get people in trouble. Tattling or snitching. And I know that there are communities where snitches mean stitches. Children do really worry about that retaliation aspect, and we need to make sure we're we're very careful when children come to us with reports of bullying. That's something that we're really concerned about, that a child has a landing pad for a difficult story about bullying um, that receives the information and then protects the child that came. Uh, I would also say, too, that uh, adults need to be to remember how very powerless children feel when they're being bullied. So that when they come forward to talk about what they're experiencing, Experiencing, when they come to an adult, it's really the last thing that they will have tried. They will have tried to bring it, which is what my mother told me. They're just, just it's just days it'll pass. Um, they really have tried it. They may have even tried a physical response, or they may have tried making fun of the, you know what's going on, making fun of themselves. They've usually tried everything, and they can't be the first adult that's received the report. So take it seriously and help them them with, you know, feel safe giving that report. So those are some of the common views and myths. Now to talk about a definition of bullying. This is not a legal definition. It may not look like a definition in your school policy handbook or the disciplinary handbook. Those tend to be more towards what you not to do. So what we're going to do here is give you three hallmarks of the very best definition definitions that we're looking at. And know that, that there is not one single definition still out there in the world that, that um, bullying or cyberbullying. So three things that you can keep in your mental back pocket about bullying, uh, which help you if you have to, uh, you know, have an un a situation unfold in front of you, and then that may help you remember. First of all, that hurt or harm, and it could be any you know, any type of hurt or harm could be physical, emotional, psychological. It is done on purpose, intentionally. And the intentionality is really important when we are trying to figure out is it conflict, is it bullying, is it an accident what happened? So, intentionality done on purpose. Now, the second one is a feature that sometimes is very difficult for people to understand, but especially kids. The target of the bullying really can't stop what's going on. Very often they might stop it temporarily or they may find a way of dealing with it that actually hurts them, but they really struggle to make any kind of meaningful impact against the bullying. This is why adults really need to be involved. It's not something that targets our children more, but uh, this is why we, you know, emphasize that adults are caring and trusted adult needs to be involved in the bullying. The target can't get it to stop. Most often, it takes 
that caring adult to get to finally stop. So the third thing revolves around power, and this is very important. Uh, the student doing the bullying has more power of some kind, and this, the most uh, obvious examples are physical power, where the child doing the bullying is stronger, uh, physically stronger and can make a set of physical aggression that the target believes. And or emotional or social power. So, so the child doing the bullying might have more friends or they might know how to manipulate another person. They have more of a certain kind of emotional learning that tells them this person who's bullying is weaker and they have that kind of power over them. The one that's not here, and that is in most school, school district definitions, is repetition. So there is some disagreement about this out in the community. For legal purposes, um, most schools I know of are going to want to see a pattern of behavior. They're going to want to see repeated incidents. So one incident of um, maltreatment by another student may not be enough to call it bullying for school, even though the target may feel profoundly affected by that one event and the promise of more events. That is something that um, people who bullying prevention are grappling with. How do we uh, one event and understand that there's the likelihood that that's going to happen again if there isn't intervention? That's something that people are struggling with, but I can assure you that for me, if somebody threatened me and I believe the threat, I don't. It doesn't require much more than one time. So, those are things to look at. Uh, but to know that the legal definitions look different from what you're seeing here on this slide. Just as a way for you to remember it most easily. And I do that because a lot of the adults and certainly the children that we are nurturing and teaching don't often understand the difference between bullying and conflict. Uh, and this is really important, especially in the early years in primary and in elementary school, early on when children don't understand that what they do can actually hurt another person. We don't call it bullying. Uh, once they understand that their actions are actually hurting another person and they continue them, even though the understanding that what they're doing is hurting or harming the other person, then we would call it bullying. So in conflict will self-monitor their behavior and generally stop when they find out that they're hurting someone that is a friend or that they're in relationship with. They don't want to lose friends, or gain friends, or keep the ones they have. They really don't want to lose them. So they find a way, once they understand, and it's not instantaneous for most children, when they hurt someone, they try to change something. And they need our help and guidance to do that. But really, their goal is not to hurt or harm. Whereas in bullying, the goal is to hurt or harm, as we said before. The hurt or harm is intentional. It's done on purpose. And so, of course, if my goal is to hurt or harm and I find out what I'm doing is hurting or harming you, I'm going to keep going. And the feeling that I get. Uh, when I see you react, gives me a sensation of power and control. So if I like that feeling, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, you'll notice here with both of these um, points on the slide that we're emphasizing behavior. We want to do that because, again, as I said in the beginning, bullying is about behavior. We want people to focus on what, what's being done, you know, what the children are doing what the behavior is in the situation. We do that because very often what happens is people use labels like bully or victim, and, and then things grind to a halt. Then we don't have a place to go. How do we change that? Those are very fixed labels for a lot of adults. We want to focus on behavior because bullying is a learned behavior. As such, it can be unlearned. It's not easy, but it's in and so children, these roles that they have, um, they change and move. During the course of a single day, a child can go from bullying to being someone who's a target later on. A child can go from bullying on the bus to saving a seat for another child who's being bullied at lunch. 
So these roles are fluid, and we want to always be focusing back on the behavior. Very important to remember that. And a special shout out to two groups who are the most impacted in childhood years, students with disabilities, as I said before, being a rate of two to three times that of their non-disabled peers. And then the eight out of 10 LGBTQ students who are asked at school most every day. And it's probably higher because we know we're not hearing all of the reporting. That figure, uh, it's 64% of kids not reporting the bullying they're experiencing. So these must also be taken with that fact in mind. And we need to make sure that students with disabilities and LGBTQ youth are protected um, anywhere they are, that there are watchful and caring adult eyes, and also peers who will advocate for them or just be allies and stand with them. about those pro-social tools. Let's talk about the things that make a difference in school communities, that make them healthier, that make them sounder, that make the ground of the community less likely for bullying to grow and flourish. And let's talk about also getting from those abstract ideas of caring to actual acts of caring. How do we get it from an idea in an adult's head to an idea in a child's head to an actual act um, that includes kind or acceptance of difference or inclusion. Those are the behaviors that make relationships better. Those are the behaviors that are characterized by concern for the rights, feelings, and welfare of other people. And those things like empathy, like helping, like comforting others, sharing and cooperation, which we talk about a lot with young kids. But it's hard for all of us, even adults. That great healthy community. And there are three that have been zeroed in on by research. Now, this is young research. It's not very old. But from what we're learning, these are things that could really make a difference. And those three pro-social tools that are kindness, acceptance of difference, and action. They're here to be the ones that help protect communities, that help protect children from being bullied as much, and also allow them to understand what's healthy friendship behavior, what's healthy human behavior, recognize when there are unhealthy relationship behaviors that are around them. That is very, very important uh, in middle school and high school. So we really want to get those tools taught early. And kids need to see them in action. They cannot learn these tools of kindness, acceptance, and inclusion by just reading about them or by talking about them. They need to see adults and people around them modeling those behaviors. So the big strategy for kindness, acceptance, and inclusion is this. We need to have age-appropriate approaches. Obviously, we need to be speaking to kids in languages that they'll understand. I always think, as a teacher, the more concrete, the better. So we talk about kindness. What does an act of kindness look like? Um, and add to age-appropriate approaches, what's going to work for whatever child you're dealing with, add to that that incredibly important piece of adults mentoring teaching, intentionally and consistently using good language that is research-based, comes from evidence-based uh, studies, so we know we're really on the right track. And all of the adults in a community, from the maintenance person up to the principal or headmaster of the school, that everyone is doing the same thing, and their responses are always underscoring. I'm just so this can then actually bring about a big impact in a school community um, and really promote group harmony. So if we can get these three pro-social tools in particular operating in our communities, kids can do the things that they're supposed to do in schools, you know, learn and play and have fun and learn about relationships. 
and being afraid and anxious and worried um, that that next, or that they're going to have to see the person bullying them right next to them in the classroom. So, some strategies for promoting kindness, acceptance, and inclusion. So, on the interaction and communication side of things, just of things that we would tell people on the front lines, faculty, staff, parents. Uh, of those six things that are up there, the last two are the ones that adults to go to the most. You know, we talk our way out of it as fast as possible, a little bit of information, and then send the child off and hope that, you know, they get it, that something happens. Information, you know, sometimes it unfortunately goes back to those common views and myths. Just ignore it and they'll go away. Or, you know, just don't, don't talk like that. And, you know, you know, see other kids talk, or something that asks the target actually to, to assume responsibility. So I'm very wary of, of reaction in myself to immediately go to advice. Here's what you should do. Here's what you should not do. Because what we really need to do, and what children who are being bullied or children who are in a bullying dynamic, even as a witness, need us to do first to listen. By believe and be supportive, I don't mean not holding them accountable if they've been adding to this dynamic as, as a person bullying or not standing up as a witness, but that we believe and supportive of the story that's coming to us right in that moment. So the child feels there's an openness. They can tell us what's going on. I often tell parents that if I had a list, of a hundred things for them to do, the first 99 would be listen. Listen, listen, listen. That's what children who are being bullied want the very most. And they want it from their peers as well. So teaching, modeling that and then teaching that to kids, literally asking them, what did you hear your friends say? Which I know a lot of teachers do already and parents as well, but very important that we keep reinforcing that listening piece in itself. It's the hard hardest thing to do. And if you're leading a class of 35, it's impossible to do during most times, right? I know that if you're a recade on the yard, I know that you have 100, maybe 200, maybe more children running around. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. And we can create strategies for supporting the individual child when you're in a group situation. We can get better about that. So, Fostering trust and modeling behavior, talking about strategies for including kindness, acceptance, and inclusion, about trust, because very often when reports come to adults, they're just telling us that their response is so variable that kids really don't trust us. They don't trust we know what we're talking about because every adult they go to is something slightly different and often gives them advice that doesn't work. So we get better about what we're saying when we do speak. And we need to know that their trust in us is allowing them to report to us. And told, find adult you trust and tell them what's going on. Children have, have absorbed that very well. But what often happens is the adults are not keeping up their end of the bargain or they just don't know how. There are good hearts and good intentions involved, but they don't know what to do in a concrete sense. And so messages back to them, our modeling of those things, the ideas that we're telling them are important, have to be very, very consistent. And we have to make sure that we're protecting a child that reports or a child that has come to us, that we're protecting the confidentiality, but in some sense, too, also keeping their name out of the larger child world where this stuff is happening. Because retaliation is a guarantee in many, many instances, most instances, somebody's going to say, you snitched, you old. So there are teachers, there are staff that have strategies about that, and it's a good idea for schools to swap some best practices. If you know you have a teacher that, that kids come and report to and it's successful, talk about what they're doing. It may be something so simple as a child comes to report and to all watching, it seems like a just happy conversation. And then the child goes away, and whoever's watching might notice that nothing happens right then. So if you know some staff that operate that way, they don't act until period in the next morning, as long as not immediate danger. 
answer to the person who's being bullied. They, they get to do it. A little bit of time has passed. So we want to help those children who feel comfortable coming to us to make sure we continue that trust. So, and the idea of caring to access caring, and that's not just for students, it's for us as well, because as I keep saying, we need to be modeling. So we need to not have kindness, acceptance, and inclusion as an abstract concept, even for us. We'd be connecting the ideas, the dots between the ideas actual, physical, concrete acts of kindness and acceptance and inclusion out in the world for all to see, but especially helping the people who need it. So we need to be very intentional and very open about those things. You can use stories. I believe in the power of stories and narratives, both books, um, videos, and movies, all those things. Um, those things can bring the viewers or the readers closer to empathy empathy looks like and what actual experience of doing these things look like. But it isn't a substitute for us being on our feet and demonstrating those things. And I do like role play as well for kids. Um, sometimes you can tap into the power of older students coming in and doing role plays with situations or scenarios that have been happening in your school community or in your class, and that works very well. But one of the tricks is that we really need to engage everyone. Taking school as an example, everybody, every constituency in the community needs to be engaged. So it's not just the students, but it's faculty, it's the staff, everyone from the person in the lunchroom to the bus driver to the maintenance person, all the staff in the office, the school nurse, everybody using the same language, same concepts, and the same energy behind what's right. And then, you know, the pet community, getting them involved as well in a healthy relationship, collaborative relationship with the school. Same information, same language, same modeling. And if you can, inviting in the larger community around the school, law enforcement, health professionals, what you can do to bring them into that conversation, the more people around your students or your children who are understanding how to get of carrying out into the world, the better that world is going to be for sure. So, and positive strategies. We're going to talk about peer advocacy, which is a peer-led faculty mentored program to help students with disabilities. We're going to talk about student -led programs because that's powerful, having students speak to one another, or older students speak to younger students. There's some magic that happens there. And some simple things you can do uh, if your community doing these things. Um, so we're going to talk about that. The thing that I want to talk about is a bit of curriculum that you can find on our main website called the Peer Advocacy Program. Wonderful, wonderful program. And it is designed to give a student with disabilities uh, a policy of uh, champions, factors around them. And how it works, it's, it's based on the idea that you care about someone you don't know about. You can't advocate for somebody that you don't know about. So we teach students um, about a specific disability and teach them about what it looks like, why this student does what they do physically or the way they talk or whatever it is. And then we take these four or five students who are educated in one child's disability and we empower them to be advocates around that child. So they are eyes on the ground where adults sometimes are not. And they will walk with a child. They, they will, you know, through the passing periods from class to class. And, and here's a wonderful byproduct of this. They also bring them into the social life of the school. So I made a video for you and show you what some students in Minnesota who did the peer advocacy program, um, they liked about what they learned from it. And maybe you can see this thing that happened for these students who were part of this program. Because uh, it's very powerful and it's very, very important. Okay, so some of the things that they're talking about in this video is that they didn't know that 
students with disabilities. They were in separate classes, they walked together, they didn't go to assemblies. And once they had the peer advocates in place, they could bring them to these other social events. They could bring them to the cafeteria and eat together. And this is so much. What you saw in that video is just how proud the peer advocates are what they did. When we surveyed them, they say, 100% of them said we would do it again. Every school should do it. So it creates a web of caring, creates a web that's a safety net around students with disabilities who are not known by the normal student body. Very important to do programs like this so that everyone knows everyone in the school. And by knowing them, they care about them. I, I think it's wonderful. So other student-led initiatives, uh, we will generation is a curriculum that we have that is uh, suitable for middle school and high school. It's student-powered but faculty-mentored. And it's the whole, the whole thing is up there on the web for you to take a look at. I think it's about a six-week, I think about six lessons. But the collateral stuff is there as well for you to use. Cool to be Kind is actually from another nonprofit, but it is an example of student-led initiative. They have clubs at various schools, um, and I work with some of them and give them resources as well. Mentors and Protectors, that is a group that was designed by a school in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, the, and listen to what I'm going to say here in terms of energizing constituents, uh, constituencies. So dynamic teacher, dynamic uh, duo of students who had seen some very difficult cyberbullying in their school, um, suicide attempts and decided with the teacher, we don't want this anymore at our school. We want a different environment at our school. Went to the principal. So now we've got three constituencies going here. The principal said, back you. And he did. It was their second year of a completely designated period. It was an advisory period. They proposed, the students and the teacher proposed having an, a, an advisory completely devoted to bullying prevention. They named themselves as the mentors and protectors. I came in and, and helped guide them towards resources. And as I said, they're now in their second year of designing activities and programs in their school to help with bullying prevention and creating a kind of community there. They won a national award last spring. And about that, after I talk about Circle of Friends, which is another way of bringing in students with disabilities to create uh, a web of support for students with disabilities. That's another nonprofit, not ours, but I wanted you to know about all these different things um, so that you can see there's a world of things out there. Men and Protectors Award showed them something really important. Oh, here's a couple more things videos, film festivals, whatever works for your school. Storytelling. We have uh, that you can do that where students can send in their creative work for a contest and we'll run a contest or two every year with awards and that's what I wanted to say about the mentors and protectors real world outcomes so we receive artwork and poems and the wonderful thing on the left that wonderful poster on the left when this rings pick up the phone well, we we solicited these for a contest, and we received them, and we put them up on our website. So if you remember, I said that we have about one and a half million visits every year. And so these students know their artwork, their creative output on bullying and kindness and acceptance and all those things is being seen out in the world. And the world, I mean, the whole world. That's huge for them. So with things at school, wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely wonderful because you can use them. They can be done with paper and pen. When they get something like real world recognition, when the larger community says, "Hey, I see what you're doing," and for instance, the Unity Awards, which we get out, are won by um, the school in South Central. We call it the Faces of Change Award, which is just one of the Unity Awards. When they won that, that was huge for them. They were recognized, and they. Were were people who were parents, who weren't just the teachers at school, who they feel maybe have to say nice things, but they were recognized in a larger sense. That means everything. The pictures on the left were from a peace march done in my community about after an act of bullying. So 
impressed by these kids uh, with some adult help or this huge thousand, like, like thousand people showed up, including people that didn't even have kids who were concerned about kindness. And that gentleman in the left-hand picture there with a sign that says, be kind, made out of a box symbolic or characteristic of the people who showed up. And it was really impressive. I did a difference in the community. So that real world outcome is important. Um, so let's remember that as adults in the community, that kids really get uh, something that shows them that the world is listening and watching. That means a lot. For assessing your community, what might work in your community? If you're up on our website, looking at the resources there, what you need to consider is who you can involve. What is the culture of your school or your community or your family? Um, who has the energy? Who has the commitment? Who has the drive? So for a school community, I look at all these different constituencies, not just the faculty, but the people who can give us for things to go forward, like administrators and staff, staff like the folks in the lunchroom, staff like the rec aides on the yard, staff like people driving or maintaining um, the, the physical infrastructure at school, when they survey kids about who they trust most, a common response that comes back is the maintenance person, you know, a judgmental adult who, uh, who says no to them. That means a lot. So sometimes there's staff that don't, we think, are not directly influencing children, but they are. They are. And kids know who they are. So who those people are because they really do provide off landing pads for kids um, who feel they have other adults to talk to. Parents, there's a dynamic parent. Sometimes she's a person who has a lot on her plate. Sometimes he's someone who just wants to be involved and is needing something to be involved with. And um, because it's really helpful for schools to engage collaboratively with parents, before problems happen, I think, you know, kindness, acceptance, and inclusion is a good place to put parental energy when it wants to be involved. So, dynamic parents. And then student leaders and influencers. And by that, I don't just mean the kids who always raise their hand to do a leadership thing or who are already doing leadership things. They'll come to help anyways. But I'm talking about kids who aren't yet acknowledged as leaders, maybe the diamonds in the rough or something like that, who really do know the vulnerable kids in their community. These kids estimate it's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. Some experts say it's as high as 90 percent of kids are not involved in a bullying dynamic, but they want to do something. Kids really do want to do something about bullying. And so if we can get a hold of those kids who have influence, who want to do something about bullying, get them to lead um, and to be good peer advocates and good allies when things are happening, we will have so much power. So looking at energy, commitment, and drive. And that's when you look at all the constituencies in the school, that's who you're looking at right there. Figure out what gets them energized, what gets them excited to do something. If you're doing an event, and I'm not always big on events, but for starting things off and then for a culmination, events can be great. We have a day every year in October, and that's a great way to raise awareness. Awareness. So look at, you know, easy to organize and get everybody involved in helping. Don't think that you have to have the idea and organize. That's hard. Get people to help you. That's where parents come in. Uh, that's where um, kids can come in, too. And they want to be a part of it. And they should be a part of the dialogue. So figure out, is it appropriate for everyone? Should it be food? I always vote for food. I always get people to um, music. Um, everybody loves the wristbands. I'm all about the wristbands. You got to do the wristbands. And t-shirts. We sell t-shirts every year. Right now we have a um, fundraiser up on Omaze uh, tied into the movie Wonder. And the t-shirts say choose kind. They're wonderful. But big people are because you want this action and this energy and all everything about these pro-social tools of kindness, acceptance, and inclusion to go viral. You want everybody to get into the action. And, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, we still have usually scissors and paper and, and some things that you can do that will still attract a lot of attention. People love arts and crafts. And early on in primary, in, in, in K-5 years, 
you know, arts and crafts are, are everything. Um, and that candy tree that was a few slides ago, that's something that schools love to do. And I've seen some beautiful ones. But you might have kids that are very interested, in, and, and most of are, in holding a microphone or doing videos. Uh, animation, great. Use that. Figure out who your students are and use their energies. Often, and role plays, I said before, can really help people understand about what, what's really happening with bullying or what acts of kindness look like um, throughout the year, planning throughout the year, not just National Bullying Prevention Month, and something that's community oriented, just the community of the school, but invites in the larger community to join in the discussion about kindness because I guarantee you they're interested. Once, as I said before, um, I'm, if that's all you're going to do, that's enough. An assembly can get kids excited, but it doesn't tell them what to do in the following day or the following month. We get them all excited, but they need those concrete strategies. It's an event that continue on throughout the year. Um, and so we came up with something called All In. I'm sorry, the title's not up there, but All In is a, a free year's worth of activities. You can sign up. If you go to the main website, type in the little search box, All In. It will take you to a page where you can sign up. And then free every month, you will get um, a lesson plan suitable for whatever grade level you're in. I, you might get videos. You might get discussion guides. Uh, you might get other activities. So great for educators, or if you have, for instance, a scout troop, or you have some kind of community organization, or you have an after school educator or a parent that wants to keep that topic alive, you know, month after month, day after day, which is really the long term work of bullying prevention. So all in is the name of that. Please go take a look and sign up. Again, our online resources are, are available for you 24-7. Um, if you are after children in your house or in your classroom, they can go up to one of the appropriate sites and really participate and learn and educate themselves, learn to be advocates, learn to be self-advocates. Because our model from advocating for kids with disabilities is to teach, you know, be advocates, but also teach self-advocacy so that kids can go out and learn to talk about what they need and learn to talk about what might be hurting them or what's working well for them to talk about uh, their needs and wishes and desires. We think that's really important, and especially with bullying, where bullying takes away a child's power and control. Things like the activities we have up here, and especially our student action plan, which is another thing to look for, type in the main site. It's available on all three sites, but type in on the main side on the search box, Student Action Plan, and pull that up. If you have a child involved in a bullying dynamic in any way, even as a witness, have them work through that with you. And you'll see, give them back a sense of power and control about what's going on, which is very important. Children need to be a part of this dialogue, and we need to be good landing pads for their reports and for that dialogue. So I welcome any and all um, to go and take a look at that. Take a look at also the resources tab on the main site. If you need statistics or facts to go to the school board or to um, your administrators or to anyone and talk about these things, it's all up there. And anytime you have questions for me, I am absolutely happy to answer them. There is my email. Happy to hear from anyone and provide you or connect you to resources. Thank you very much for your time today. I very much appreciate, again, uh, the Anti-Bullying Institute of Riverside Medical having me. Thank you very much. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes, yeah, very good. Informative. Thank you. It was nice to be able to pay attention to you without other stuff going on. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking I was a little... It was probably even clearer today, so um, so anyways. Well, thank you, young lady. Oh, thank you equally, young lady. <laughs> well, I'll you posted, and um, I'll send you, I have the cyberbullying presentation that was finished, so I'll send that to you, too, so you can take a look. See. Awesome, awesome. And, um, yeah, anything that comes up, um, you know, always 
always love being dialogue with you. I hope you have a great holiday season. Get some rest. So. Oh, sounds good. Bye, Denise. Bye-bye. Bye.